I'm Elaine Engelhart from Utah Valley University, and welcome to our discussions on democracy. Today, we're going to be talking with some special guests about energy ethics and China and the U.S. with energy ethics. And we've invited as our guest Dr. Carl Mitchum, and Carl is at Colorado School of Mines. We've also got Dr. Leo Chen, who is here at Utah Valley University, and Dr. Michael Pritchard, a professor of philosophy from Western Michigan mm -hmm. University. So welcome to all of you. And uh, this is a very fun and interesting topic, I think, for us, but also extremely serious. And um, Carl, what got you um, interested in um, studying energy ethics and especially focusing on China and the U.S.? Well, I guess it was the primarily the, uh, the discussions that were happening in the United States about our energy policies and what was the best way to pursue the uh, continuing production of energy. And then I had been visiting China and noticed that China was doing things a little bit differently than the United States. And that stimulated me to try to reflect on uh, these issues. Well, thank you. And Dr. Chen, as a, a professor of finance, what brings your interest to energy ethics and U.S. and China? Well, I'm from China originally, and I grew up in this country, and I have different cultural, perspec different cultural perspectives on uh, the way your energy is being utilized or how energy is being um, um, abused uh, when economic uh, growth uh, become to get to a higher level. And uh, I, I was born in a farm that has no electricity uh, when I was a little kid, and then we started to have light bulbs, and the environment was very clean. You know, as a boy, we would run around the countryside, you know, drink water from the creek. When I went back, um, just 10, 15 years later, um, the streams are all dead. Uh, we have more electricity, we have more uh, things available uh, that runs on electricity, but then uh, many of the things that we enjoy as a kid are no longer enjoyable. Uh, you cannot enjoy the outdoor anymore. So it, it got me into thinking about this concept uh, of you know, what really um, is a good life. And for a finance economic perspective, I might have something to contribute to this uh, discussion that uh, other people who are not familiar may not understand because I think a lot of the uh, concept in popular <coughs> media that we uh, uh, get from uh, about economic and finance is not true. Uh, one of the biggest uh, misconceptions is about the, the, the concept of the, uh, um, free, uh, the free market capitalism, the invisible hand. The invisible hand is not really uh, what people know about. And I think when we misinterpret or misapply those concepts, that's what got us into doing the wrong thing for society. So that's why I'm uh, interested to you know, pursue uh, the discovery further into this topic. Oh, thank you. And it's been great getting to know you with this. Now, Mike, I know that you and Carl both have uh, books in engineering ethics and that you enjoy teaching engineers um, ethical concepts. Why is it important for these engineers, especially those involved with energy, to study ethics, to understand that they need to have some kind of a, a, a moral goal? Well, I think that it's clear that engineers and their work have a tremendous impact on our society in general and uh, with the consumption of goods and, and so forth. And uh, it's tempting to think of engineering as simply technical and computational and so forth, but uh, engineers do their work to serve certain ends that might be the ends of anyone, mm -hmm. uh, certainly not just engineers. And uh, the basic value questions that, that we all have should be addressed in some way by, by engineers. It's not a neutral uh, sort of activity if you are an engineer. You're doing something that some people place value on. What do you think about that, Carl? Where do, where, where do engineers come into this moral concept uh, and energy? Well, I guess I would start with just that engineers are also citizens. Sure. And that it's important to be in an engineering school. We're not just a trade school. Uh, this is not just teaching a skill, but it's, it, the goal is to teach, to encourage students to become participating citizens in a democracy. And they can't become participating citizens in a democracy simply by developing technical knowledge and technical skills. 
So not just engineering education, but any education in the United States today, given our commitments to democracy, requires that we try to broaden students' perspectives so that they understand how they can contribute, how they can bring their skills some, from some particular area to the larger conversation that citizenship requires in a democracy. Thank you. And I think that probably what Leo is saying as well is that he doesn't want his finance students just worrying about the bottom line. He wants um, moral goals as, as part of their work, too. Yeah. Well, I think w one of the uh, basic questions that we don't really think about uh, in this conversation of free market capitalism is the idea of um, social cause. Um, uh, Ronald Coase won the Nobel Prize for his sing, uh, similar work in uh, the problem of social cause in 1961. And the basic concept is this, when we enjoy something that produces some pollution or some harmful effect, we're imposing costs on the society. And the society could expand to just beyond a community, country, and, and nation. Think about this, think about it this way. Let's say if you're a very wealthy person, you have 20 cars, you have four gigantic mansions. Well, all this car and uh, 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 heating costs and cooling costs produce pollution. You are just one person. You're very wealthy, fine. But you probably produce 100 times more pollution than any other average uh, individual in a society. Is it fair to the society to allow you to produce all this pollution? Because what happens is that you say, well, you know, the pollution also po produce harmful effect on me and my families too. And similarly, we can push this concept or discussion into country, you know, wealthy nation. Mm -hmm. You know, America is uh, the number one energy consumer. It also happens to be the number one uh, polluter in the world. Is it fair to the rest of the world? And, you know, a lot of people in this country think, you know, we're, we're donating so much money to help poor country. But we, at the same time, we're actually exporting a lot of pollution to other countries. It just happened that majority of the people in this country are not seeing those. So we have to really think about not just the bottom line, but our concern and compassion for other people. But Carl, you've, um, you've been a globetrotter. You've uh, been to quite a few areas of the world to uh, visit about energy ethics. Where, where have you really been impressed? Well, with, uh, uh, I would say that the two countries in the world that have impressed me the most for quite different reasons are the Netherlands and China. Uh, there are other countries in Europe that also are doing things uh, in a very unique way. I think of Denmark, uh, to some extent Germany. Um, the, uh, it's interesting that in Germany right now, even though Germany is relatively far north and is a kind of cloudy country, that they are actually re getting more electricity from solar uh, power than the United States as a percentage, not, uh, uh, not as an absolute amount. Um, so that different countries have policies for about how they're going to develop their energy resources. And in Europe, the policies are quite different than the United States, and they're, again, different in China. So comparing and contrasting these different approaches has struck me as a way to learn and to enhance the discussion in our democracy about what we should be doing, rather than just assuming always that we've got the one best way. I think we need to learn in our democracy to compare and contrast what other countries are doing and be willing to learn and not always say, well, we've got the one best system. Thank you. And Mike, how does this global perspective help your students, whether they're uh, taking a professional ethics class or an engineering ethics class? I think that um, noticing differences between uh, the United States and other countries can be helpful for starters. I recall uh, an eye-opener for me many, many years ago. I went to uh, England for the year. Uh, gasoline in the United States at that time cost about 45 cents a gallon. and uh, I was paying almost $2 a gallon in Great Britain that year, and when I went to France, I was paying $2.50 a gallon. I got used to it. I came back to the United States, and people were screaming that it was now 65 cents a gallon. It was outrageous and so forth, and I said, well, you should look at what happens in Europe. And, but, and this, you know, why, why are there these differences? And, uh, you know, going back to your point, Leo, I mean, if, if uh, the United States is, uh, a big, big consumer, but paying less than the rest of the world, is that fair? 
Let me, let me pick up on that and, and make a specific comparison here. In the United States, on average, we consume eight tons equivalent of oil per person per year. And that gives us a certain quality standard of living. In Europe, I don't think we would say that people have a significantly different quality of life or standard of living, but they consume four tons equivalent of oil per year. Now that means they, they consume half of the oil, the tons oil equivalent. So this is all sorts of energy consumption, whether it's from coal or oil or nuclear power or solar power. They consume half of the power that we do. And yet my experience of living for extended periods of time in both the Netherlands and in Spain is that they have a quality of life that's significantly above ours. Certainly in the level of health care, their health care system is better. It covers more people. Uh, if you compare quality of health in, in countries in Europe, all of them are superior to the United States in that they have lower infant mortality rates, greater longevity rates, greater rates of longevity with quality of life. So that they're not just, we're not talking about just when people are senile and how long they live, but how long they live with using all their faculties. All European countries are superior to the United States in a large spectrum of quality of life indicators. We rank something down in the 20s if you compare quality of life in different countries. And yet we're consuming twice the energy and power of our nearest competitor. There's something wrong with that. There, there really is. And then, um, you know, I would think that uh, if you were going to tell me what the same rate was in China, well, I would expect it would probably be pretty high because I watched the Olympics on TV and I saw the pollution in Beijing and I knew they were very much trying to get a, a hold of the pollution uh, in Beijing. But um, well, let me, let me what, mention uh, the, the, the issue of the, the Olympics. I was, uh, um, I watched some of the Olympics on uh, NBC as well. And um, I was surprised the next year when I went to Beijing for the first time in 10 years. I'd been to China a number of times, but I'd avoided Beijing because in 1998, when I was there in the last time, it was so polluted. There were no birds. The parks were dead. And I went again in 2009, and I was amazed. Uh, the parks were alive. The parks were green. I remember waking up at the, Chinese, the campus of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and hearing birds outside. I thought at first, my first response was, they're piping in bird sounds. You know, that's what they're, that's what they're doing. But I, I went outside of my little hotel room, and sure enough, there were birds there. And then I got a, uh, a little tour of the Olympic Park, Olympic Village, and I was amazed. On every single light pole, there was either a small wind generator or a solar panel or both. Now, why is it? that NBC, in its coverage of the Olympic Games, never showed that on television, at least not when I was watching. They would always pan out and you would see the cube, or they'd pan out and you'd see the, uh, the bird's nest, but they would never just sort of walk at, uh, show you pictures at a level of detail where you could see that in the large parking lot areas, there were all, the, there were all these alternative sources of energy to power all the lights at the Olympic Village. Now, is there, when the United States has hosted any Olympics, have we made that kind of commitment to alternative energy pr production when we built all these new facilities? I mean, I think that was just remarkable. I, I want to add something to that. Uh, actually, China, uh, you, you being the Kunming, you know that many tall buildings on the top of the roof, yeah. on the rooftop, there are solar panel, there's actually solar heat wa uh, water heaters. Right. And if and, and actually, majority of the new water heater are solar heated. And if China, the GDP per capita is about one tenth of actually one twenty of the U.S. And they can afford a solar power water heater. Why can't we do it in the United States? Right. You know, exactly. that's that's a very very important question we have to ask ourselves. You know, is it really we cannot afford it, or is it someone 
pushing a certain type of policy or certain sources that prevent us from getting those at reasonable cost. And go back to the questions uh, that you raised earlier, uh, Michael, about the uh, uh, um, uh, long-term effect of uh, using oil. The reason why European were having such a better lifestyle or, or longer uh, um, uh, life expectancy uh, was because they use a lot less uh, um, fossil fuel. And we didn't take into account the cause of lo the long-term harmful effect we have uh, from using fossil fuel in this country into account. Um, Salt Lake City happens to be one of the deadliest area in the country in terms of the air quality. Um, but people in this place, uh, in this particular area, keep pushing for more and more fossil fuel. And the reason is because they don't see the long-term effect. What they see is, you know, I want to have you know, more jobs or more uh, uh, tax revenue in the next three to five years. But they didn't think about, well, you know, if all this kids work up breathing in all this bad air, they're going to have asthma, they're going to have uh, long-term health problem, uh, some may get cancer in, 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 uh, somewhere down the road. And <laughs> some of those uh, air pollutants, uh, in Utah in particular, they get up in the uh, atmosphere, snow comes down, trapped in the snow, packed on the snow, and then it, be it becomes um, um, uh, snow melt uh, uh, water coming down to our water supply. We are eating and drinking our own pollution. It's a, it's a stark thing to think about, isn't it? And, and coming from Michigan, Mike, do you notice that in Michigan there are, are quite a few energy-saving um, initiatives, such as uh, I think quite close to where you live in Kalamazoo, there uh, is a nuclear power plant. Don't know how you feel about that. Mm -hmm. you, you might mention it. Um, and I understand there's a big wind-generating farm that's, um, that's uh, going to be coming up on Lake Michigan. Any, any thoughts about how Michigan is trying to pursue alternative energy to the fossil fuels? Well, the, uh, the nuclear power industry has been in Michigan for many years, and it's been highly controversial. Uh, the, there are risks that come with uh, nuclear power, we know. Uh, there are risks that come with all other energy sources that, that we make <laughs> extensive use of. Um, and uh, the, the BP uh, accident in the Gulf of New Mexico should make all of us aware that things can go very, very badly very quickly, and we don't necessarily know what to do about it to, to remedy uh, th this sort of thing. Uh, solar energy may be less risky uh, than, than all, and there's a cliche, uh, where there's a will, there's a way, and I suspect that we need to work on the will. Uh, mm -hmm. both uh, within industry and in, in our society in general, and we may find significant changes. Now, Michigan, uh, economically, is in very bad straits at this time, and uh, we're looking for alternatives to uh, the, what's called the Rust Belt. Uh, you know, Michigan depended so heavily for years and years on the automotive industry. Uh, the automotive industry is changing a great deal now, uh, hopefully in, in more environmentally friendly ways. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't be surprised that, that there are innovative strategies developing in Michigan, whether they will take hold uh, and ac actually uh, change things and set a model for elsewhere. Uh, it, it's hard to tell at this point, but I think that sometimes we need to suffer before we uh, begin to wake up and try to do something. And the hope is that our suffering has occurred early enough uh, that we can creatively respond uh, to some of these problems. You know, Mike, I think that both you and I as as uh, professors in engineering universities and teachers of engineers have a special responsibility in this respect. Um, I, I think you would probably agree that it's often engineers who need to imagine these, some of these alternatives mm -hmm. and present them to the corporations that they're working for. They can't rely just upon the executives or the managers or the, the, uh, the shareholders in corporations coming up with these ideas and they shouldn't be just responsive to the immediate needs of the corporation, but should be trying to think long term for the society and then getting their corporation, their corporations that they work for to, to commit some of their resources to developing alternative ways to deal with some of the energy problems that we have. But it's hard, isn't it, to get, since the engineers all come out of a world that makes certain kinds of assumptions, I find it very difficult to get my students to imagine different ways of doing things at the technical level. 
And you know, mm -hmm. it can happen uh, with an individual, with an individual doing this. In Milford, Utah, there was a science teacher and uh, he, he challenged his high school students mm -hmm. to work on alternative energy. They got a wind farm going. Mm -hmm. And the wind farm has been very successful and in fact, uh, just recently, they kicked off a very high production of this wind farm. <laughs> uh, probably one of the best energy, uh, alternative energy productions in the state of Utah. Wow. So an individual can make a difference and mm -hmm. those high school students and others who who really care to see this move, move along and I know the wind blows a lot there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, might, I might add to uh, uh, what, what, what you gentlemen uh, uh, raise about the uh, uh, suffering the beginning. I think what what happened is you know we are some responsible in the finance and economic area that we didn't go out and uh, preach this idea that you got to think about the long-term payoff, not just focus on the initial capital investment. What we, when you talk about suffering, is that we, we now have to pay a little higher cost for something. But if you think about that as a, a, a capital investment, you know, all company uh, has uh, money for capital in, uh, investment to uh, research development for uh, future products. If we think about the um, uh, money that we put into research development in uh, our renewable energy as an initial capital investment, with the, co with the benefit coming in the future from cost saving in uh, lower mortality rate, um, lower healthcare costs, better quality of life. If we can incorporate those somewhat non-monetary uh, item into monetary equivalent, uh, then suddenly the so-called suffering right now, if you look throughout the entire uh, life lifespan, the payout will be far greater than current suffering. But we really have to have the will right now, willing to put forth the, the initial investment into those kind of technology. Because when we don't do that, what happens is other countries are going to do it. And when they develop those technology, they get advanced uh, uh, in those areas much faster. You know, the, the, the growth rate is not in linear, it's more exponential. And when we try to catch up with them 10 years later, now our technology becomes obsolete. Now we have to buy technology from them. It becomes a real expensive cost five, ten years down the road. You know, um, you probably know more about this already, right. what happened in, 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 in China in terms right. of their renewable uh, energy technologies. Let me uh, uh, pick up on that. I, I think we need not only will, but intelligence. Uh, I'm teaching Kant right now in one of my engineering ethics courses. Oh, I bet they love that. Oh, of course they do. <laughs> uh, but one of the arguments that Kant makes is that we, we have to, we have natural inclinations to do things, and we have to become critical of our natural inclinations because morality arises from intelligent reflection on and critical assessment of our natural and sometimes social inclinations. Now, we live in an economic system that encourages short-term analysis of investment. We want to get re returns on our investment in a relatively short period of time, and our whole economic system is set up to reward managers and corporate executives who increase the stock value in short term. We need a system that looks longer term and that's not going to happen just from individuals. There are moral heroes as individuals who can buck the system. But we need a system which encourages all of us to reflect more intelligently and so that we don't have just to rely upon, okay, I have the will to buck the system. It encourages all of us to do things differently and to think differently about the way we're living in our democracy. And how do you encourage your students, Mike, to do long-term moral thinking instead mm -hmm. of just for today or just for the bottom line? Well, one thing I'm very interested in is the, the, uh, the history of codes of ethics in professional societies, particularly in engineering. And if you go back to uh, before the 1970s, almost all the codes said the first responsibility of the engineer is to be loyal to the employer or the client. So guess who calls the shots? In the In, engineers are on tap, not on top. Right, yes, <laughs> yes. Or guns for hire or right. whatever. But in the, uh, in the early 1970s, the codes began to change. 
And uh, now almost all of them say that the paramount obligation of the practicing engineer is to protect public health and safety as they're doing their professional work. Now, I encourage my students to ask, well, what does it mean to protect public health and safety? That's not a short-term goal. That's a long-term sort of thing. Uh, it's also the case that virtually none of the codes would say anything about uh, environmental responsibilities. And now a growing number of codes are saying that, that the engineer has a fundamental responsibility in regard to protecting the environment and uh, trying to go for sustainable uh, technology. You know, that's, yeah. that's an important uh, uh, area of reflection on the codes of ethics, Mike, and I'm sure as, as you know, one of the places where engineers first picked up the importance of protecting the environment was in the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, so that it was at the international level, the, the first code of ethics, as far as I know, that included a, a responsibility for engineers to protect the environment was in the WFEO uh, Code of Ethics from the 1980s. And so it happened at the global level where it didn't happen at the individual local level. This is a good example of thinking globally, acting locally. Mm -hmm. Thinking globally, we, uh, we were able to recognize the importance of global environmental responsibility. And since then, like the American Society of uh, Civil Engineers has included uh, environmental responsibility, but it, but, it, but it began with comparing and contrasting and becoming aware of what was happening at a global level. And I think in our democracy today, there's not enough willingness to think globally. We always think too much, what's best for my nation? Like right now in the United States, there's the debate about ratifying the New START Treaty. And all the debate is whether it will be best for the United States. We should be looking at whether it's going to be good for the world, not just for the United States. Now, I've got to finish up a question that I started about 10 minutes ago with you, Carl. And that is, um, you mentioned that the U.S. has about eight tons of energy uh, usage and Europe about four. Where is China? China and is under one. They're under one, and are they continuing to try to keep this under one? Are they listening to their own scientists? Well, this, this is, uh, I, I, I've got to call attention to a, a graph that I got out of the uh, China Daily um, in 2009, I think it was, when I was last there. Um, on the front page of the China Daily, there was a bar graph, a histogram, showing the total amount of, of carbon produced by different countries since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so since, since about 1850. Now, if you, look, if you compare, the United States and the UK have emitted, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's an awful lot, and the bar graph looks like this, and the, for China, it's like this. And China is projecting that by 2030, it will be consuming not four, not eight tons oil equivalent, but 1.5 tons oil equivalent per person. And at that point, they expect to level off because they've taken as their goal for increasing consumption of um, tons of oil equivalent, the global average now, the global average now is 1.5. China, uh, China is just under one. India is only 0.4. The United States is eight. Europe is four. Europe is committed already to reducing its tons oil equivalent. The United States has no even commitment to reduce its tons oil equivalent. Uh, so China said, we're going to continue to increase our consumption. That's right. It's only fair. It's only just. You have been, for speaking to Europe and the United States, you have been consuming at a much higher rate than we're ever going to consume. Uh, so we're going to continue to increase our rate up to about 2030, but then we're going to level off. When are you going to, it asks to the Europe and the United States, when are you going to reduce your level of consumption to 1.5, which is going, which is our goal? Leo, why is that a finance well, I, question? Why is, and, and you can go ahead and make your comment <laughs> you were going to make, and then tell us why that's a, a finance concept as okay. well. Oh, I remember that graph that you have, those, those number. Uh, Europe, uh, uh, Great Britain is about 7,800. The U.S. Mm. about 7,700. China mm. is 
79,079 tons of carbon emission. Uh -huh. you, now, <laughs> 79 versus 7,800, yeah. that's, that's about 1%. Yeah. And China's bodacious goal in the 2030 is to get to 150, yeah. okay? <laughs> I mean, the word by, by, by that time, the United States and Europe will have also about ten thousand. We'll be about ten thousand. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when, when when we in the U.S. talk about how China should lower the emission, we're saying that you know, look, I'm already you know eating too much, so fat. But you know, you are skinny, you you under malnutrition, but you shouldn't eat any more because otherwise, I'm going to die of die of starvation. <laughs> that is really a a a a, a, a you know uh, ridiculous right. uh, way to uh, talk to China when you really look at those numbers. It's ridiculous. Now, why is this a, 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 a economic uh, uh, issue? Go back to uh, what I mentioned earlier about um, the idea of innovation, investing for the future. What happened, most people don't think about, is when, when we're forced into become creative in engineering, engineers are supposed to solve problems, right? So you give them a limited set of parameters, and they were supposed to make most out of it. And it's the same thing in economics. If we have the willpower to say, you know, we want to reduce carbon <coughs> emission at a certain level, then guess what? We start thinking about how we can reorganize uh, our, our city planning. How I can reorganize uh, the way we, 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 we live a life, how we consume energy, or how we produce energy. One of the things that um, is happening right now uh, in the U.S., and Detroit may be the first city, is going to be that, uh, that's, that, that place where it's going to uh, start uh, this you know, renaissance idea of um, urban farming. Okay, so Detroit is currently now have a plan of converting some of those uh, uh, rundown houses into a urban farm. Now, what does that mean? It means that a majority of the produce being consumed by the cities surrounding Detroit area, uh, be it uh, uh, Chicago or Cleveland, can be produced within a 300 mile radius uh, 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 area. It means that the cost of transportation is going to be lower, but it also means that the package cost is going to be lower. The cost of refrigerating, keeping those uh, uh, produce uh, fresh is going to be lower. That way we reduce the carbon emission. And guess what? When we eat fresh food, fresh vegetables, they have more nutritious value. And that improves our health. And in the long term, it's going to pay off in <coughs> ways of um, <coughs> reducing our health care costs, improve our quality of life. And when people start thinking about you know, that concept of urban farming, then it makes sense to actually live closer together. Mm -hmm. Then we rely less on the gas guzzler cars that you know most Americans are so accustomed to, because what happened? The reason why we Americans are using so much more energy than Europeans is because we are wasting energy on things that are not essential to our life, not essential to the way we, we live. But we are fed. We 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 are fed by the corporation, the media. So, you know, this is what we we need a we need a V eight engine, <laughs> yes, pickup truck just so that we can get from you know, UVU to uh, University Mall, okay? Because that makes us look more powerful. But that's a wrong way of thinking about what is important in our life. So I think you know, you know, if, we have, if we can get more conversation talking about the long-term payoff versus you know, placing limitation right now, we will be coming up with a different set of paradigms. And I think that was gonna improve our future. Can, can I put in a plug for a video that I like here that I think brings Absolutely. some of this home? There's, yes. there's a recent uh, movie that's now on DVD called No Impact Man. No Impact Man, I mean, right. yes, yes. And I would encourage anybody to take a look at this. It's only about 90 minutes. It's a little, it's a little documentary about a man and his family, wife and child in New York City, who decided to try for a year to slowly reduce their uh, environmental impact, their carbon footprint, to zero uh, over the course of a year. And so they did it just like Leo says, by, you know, starting first by uh, buying groceries at uh, a local, uh, local market. Um, in, in New York City, you don't need to um, have a car, but they were riding the subway, so they, and they replaced riding the subway with bicycles. Um, and then they lived on, uh, I don't remember the exact floor, uh, something like the 10th floor of a, an apartment building. And there's this, uh, there's this point in the movie where they decide they can't take the elevator anymore. They have to walk up. And this mm -hmm. increases the, the
the exercise, they no longer have to go to the gym. They were paying a fee to go to the gym to get exercise, but when they decide to not use the elevator and walk up 10 flights of stairs every day more than once uh, and carrying a one-year-old child sometimes, uh, then they got lots of exercise. The, the wife was actually a uh, borderline diabetic when they started this process. At the end of one year, she was much healthier and was no longer a borderline diabetic. And she had actually lost weight, and, and then they one, uh, about halfway through, they finally decided to cut off the electricity to their apartment. They went down in the basement. They threw a party with their friends and went down into the basement and pulled the master switch and shut off the electricity. So then they didn't even have lights, had to use candles. They decided to make their own candles. It's really a, a fun movie about what life is like and how it gets better if you try to reduce your carbon footprint. What, what would your students think about that, Mike? Would they think that you're getting a little radical on them if you were <laughs> asking them to uh, reduce their carbon footprint? Would they, would they wonder if this was some kind of a, a conspiracy? Or, or do you well, think they might see the sense in it? I, I would hope they would see the sense in it. But um, I, th I think it's also true that uh, when we look at the enormity of the problems that we have to, to, to deal with, uh, as an individual, it's tempting to say, but what can I do? And even if this small group of people does this, you know, what, what you've described, you say, that's very impressive and so forth, but that doesn't really tackle the big problem, does it? Mm -hmm. Now, I think to tackle the big problems, uh, we were talking before about the, the role of engineers, engineers have to play a huge role because <coughs> these problems have to be addressed through engineering and science and technology. Um, well, when I, when and even I, well, more than engineers, yeah. though, our democracy has to play a role because engineers have to help educate our democracy. Wow. And it's not just corporations, but we've got, as a democratic citizenry, got to make policy changes about how we want the investments of our government and our corporations to be promoted. I agree with that. Um, and uh, here again, I think that engineers and scientists and technologists can be a, a, a great help to us because I can't make up the information. As an ordinary That's citizen, right. I right. don't know how to make these things happen. Engineers sometimes say uh, they are can-do people. Mm -hmm. Can-do, okay, can-do what? Mm -hmm. Well, I can do what my employer tells me to do. I can do this or that. Mm -hmm. What if the objectives are bigger than that? What if it's uh, tackling some of the larger problems that you're talking about? You know, we, can we do this? Well, how can we do this? And if engineers are silent, or if they're looking in a different direction, we're not going to know how we can do this. It's not just me, it's us. It one, is, one, and, and uh, even here at Utah Valley University, I had an opportunity to work on a project, and it took quite a while, but there was a wonderful um, old ranch uh, at Capitol Reef National Monument. And um, it became National Park, and uh, the Park Service wasn't sure what to do with this, uh, this old dude ranch, and UVU said, we'd like to take it over. And uh, as it turned out, we went through a lot of red tape with the Park Service, but over the years, we were able to uh, raise the uh, old dude ranch that was there and put in a facility that was completely off the grid. And everything about this property uses all of the natural resources. So it's facing a direction so that the heat is used properly and the cooling is used properly. That um, there's, even though there are extreme temperatures uh, at this location, we rarely have to turn on any uh, heating or cooling. There are no electric lines that go into this property. Uh, and we even have, um, uh, solar uh, ar arrays <coughs> to get the well going so that the that, uh, water from the well is, is uh, used with solar arrays. We have a whole field of solar arrays. It's wonderful to take the students there and say this is really how you should be living your life. We've got an example right here. We have um, a dormitory there. 24 students can stay overnight and um, it's really a case in point. You're not just talking about theory. You're saying you can live this simply. It'll work. You can use solar arrays. And, um, you know, I know that Leo thinks that they, they, they may be a little uh, too expensive. There might be <laughs> better ways, but that's what we're also teaching the students. Try, try your own um, wind products. Try your own, uh, try some other energy sources right there. 
And uh, the National Park Service, it, we're, we're, I think, one of the only uh, universities that have a field station, that has a field station in National Park land. And that's why it took us so long to get it going, but now they're very proud of it. And they're very proud to have uh, everything uh, so very green and off the grid. Oh, back to the question that you raised about, uh, 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 you know, we, we, we're going to have to pay more for electricity if we switch to alternative source. But let me just give you a perspective to think about this. If, if we convert the entire United States uh, uh, electricity source going from coal to solar at the current solar price. Now, solar price has gone down by about four to five to ten percent every year. You know, it was costing more like um, uh, twenty cents per per watt to install. Now it's about seven cents per watt to install. Uh, in Utah, we have twice the number of sunlight day, uh, daylight sun uh, hour uh, daylight hours of sun sunlight available for uh, converting solar power into electricity. So, if we actually install solar power in Utah we will actually, uh, uh, with the subsidized cost, the, the, the electricity generated from using solar actually is going to be lower than coal, okay? Now, even if we're not in Utah without the subsidy, if we convert all the electricity used in the United States going from coal to solar, that would add about $10 per month to our electricity bill uh, in each household. That's about $120 per year uh, per household. Now, what does it mean, though? It means that every year, 30,000 people in this country do not have to die as a result of the harmful effect of coal, the danger going into the coal mine, getting trapped and completely crushed, um, the potential explosion uh, 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 that some of those uh, more dangerous sorts of uh, uh, electricity generation uh, might create. It. And if you multiply that over a hundred year, we could be saving about three million people. Okay, mm -hmm. just think about that. Now, do we want to value that additional ten dollars per month that we have to pay more, or do we value the life of the three million people that we might save uh, more in the future? And here's another thing. Guess what? When in economic, we know about this. When we have to pay more of something, we change our consumption habits. Would, if I know my electricity is going to go up in price, I'm not going to leave the light on you know, when I leave the room. I'm going to switch off the light. And so when we change the way we consume, not only I think we don't actually have to pay more, we're actually going to pay less. But again, it takes effort to put in the initial uh, uh, investment into uh, the solar technology or other type of renewable energy uh, technology. But then it also takes a will uh, for government for uh, educational institution to push this idea just an alternative just as alternative just think about it. you don't have to like you have to do this but think about what would the world that we live in becomes if we think about this issue more compassionate to our towards our, our human being you know the the, the chilean uh, 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 uh my worker get leave all the way everybody cheer everybody you know so happy they came out my why? Because we treasure life. But when we never really make the connection between the use of uh, uh, fossil fuel, uh, uh, fuel and the number of life laws that we have in a society every single uh, year. In the United States, <laughs> every year we have 30,000 people die unnecessary because we're using uh, fossil fuel. Do you think that the Chinese government and I know uh, the Danish government look at these costs, Carl? Um, yes, I think they do. Uh, I, was, I was thinking as uh, Leo was talking about a, um, a, a national laboratory which is right down the street from where I teach in Golden, Colorado at the Colorado School of Mines the, uh, is the National Renewable Energy Lab. This uh, National New Renewable Energy Lab was set up by President Carter back in the, uh, the 70s and uh, has been sort of limping along under various uh, administrations ever since. But in the most recent uh, Obama administration, there's been a significant influx of new investment at, at Enroll, it's known as, uh, in order to investigate, to do 
to hire engineers and scientists to do exactly the kind of research that Mike and Leo are talking about to help us make more intelligent, informed decisions about alternative ways of producing energy. Do you know we used uh, NREL to put together our fuel station? Uh -huh. We consulted with them quite a bit. So, uh, and, and right now, anybody in the country can go on to the NREL website and use uh, Google, uh, Google Map, uh, Google Earth. You can locate your house on Google Earth. It'll map out the, the, um, uh, the, the roof area. And we'll, uh, you link that to a, an application on NREL. And it will tell you how much it will cost to put uh, solar panels on your roof, where you need to put them. And, and how much it'll cost and how much energy, how much money you will save. So you, any individual in the country now can, can find out what it would cost them to invest, what, how good the sunlight is on their particular roof at their house. Uh, now, but this is still relying on individuals. And I think uh, both Mike and Leo would, would agree that we've got to go beyond just individuals and make public policy decisions to promote and support this kind of change. And can that work, Mike? Well, I think it can work. And I, again, I go back to the cliche. Uh, uh, you know, where there's a will, there is a way. Uh, absent the will, uh, we won't find the way. Uh, if we have the will, then you know, what does it mean to be serious about it? And, and here I think that there are all kinds of possibilities. Is, is there a way we could immediately know if we're using too much energy? Carl, were you telling us a story uh, well, about there, that? There's in uh, Boulder, Colorado, just 20 miles north from where I teach, um, the, the, the uh, Excel, the public utility, is actually installing what's called a smart grid. The, the grid we have is actually pretty smart. It's very complex. But they're trying to do something a little different where on each individual house, the meter will tell people how much they're using per day, not just, you know, not just, you don't have to go out and watch the meter and then remember what it, write down what it was at the beginning of the day and then go look and see what it does at the end of the day and then do the subtraction. It's telling you what your daily use is at any one point in time, just like the Prius tells you how many miles per gallon you're getting at any one instant in time. And then it sends this information both to the central uh, routing station for power but it also gives it to the individual owner so that the owner can see, oh, wait a minute, look, I'm maybe, look, what, what is my usage if it's like this all day long? It's going to be this much per, it's going to cost me this much per month. Maybe I've got some lights on somewhere in the house that uh, don't need to be on. Or maybe I'm doing something that doesn't need to be done. And uh, people do just naturally, once they l get this information, become more con conserving in their use of energy. And I know, Leo, you take great pride in, in your conserving of energy. What are some things that, that you recommend? What are some things that you do and it's really not a sacrifice? It's not a sacrifice uh, uh, for the, the things I do. Uh, one thing is when I leave the house in the winter time, I set it to 58 or uh, 60 because when you're not in the house, there's no point of heating the house. And you know, when you go to work, you're about eight, 10 hours away from the house. That eight, 10 hours, you keep burning the energy. It's completely wasteful. And then I don't, uh, I switch all my uh, light into uh, fluorescent light now. Uh, uh, the e electricity saving is amazing. I use one-fifth electricity of my next door neighbor. You, you were talking about there's a type one theory and a type two theory and, and you brought out a couple of scholars who have, have written about this. Do you, do you want to explain a little bit about that? Well, the, the, the whole energy. discussion of energy ethics has a, a, a relatively short history. It was only in the 1970s with the oil crisis, the energy crisis in the United States and Europe when uh, there was the Arab embargo on uh, oil production. Uh, that people in Europe and the United States began to think consciously about, okay, what is the ethics of use and production of energy? And there are two basic schools of thought. Um, one is to assume that energy production and use is always a good thing, that we need to always increase our energy consumption because that increases our quality of life. Um, this is what I call type one energy ethics. 
we make that assumption and then we figure out what are the best, the most efficient ways, the, the safest ways, the most ethical ways to produce the energy. But there's no question that more energy is better. Type two energy ethics questions that basic assumption and says, well, maybe more energy production is not always producing a better life, just the kind, in, in just the kinds of ways that we've been talking about here. And says, well, maybe we don't need to have more energy. Maybe the, the consumption of less energy and the production of less energy can actually increase our quality of life. Um, I think type two energy ethics, questioning the assumption that more is better with regard to energy production and use, um, is the better way to go. That's where my interest lies. And this is espoused by Ivan Illich, and what's the name of the book in case some of our viewers e would Ivan like Illich's uh, book, uh, Energy and Equity, was kind of the, the, um, the initial uh, effort in this area. It was uh, written in 1974. Uh, is included in his book toward a history of needs. Uh, and that's sort of the place to begin. But there's a lot of uh, Serge Latouche, a, a contemporary uh, economist and uh, uh, political theorist in France, who has actually been um, influential in France in getting France to rethink some of these issues too. I have a colleague in uh, France who works with uh, Serge Latouche. Um, he has a new book out, uh, What uh, the, the Degrowth Society, how we can rather than promote more growth, how we can promote degrowth. Uh, degrowth is really should be our ideal uh, because degrowth can actually increase our quality of life. An example of an engineer who sees a problem uh, that can be solved by lowering the consumption of energy and it, it comes to the, to the end that's desired. I mean, examples like that I think are very powerful and uh, uh, the more of these I can find, the better I feel about talking seriously about these problems because it's, uh, it won't do just to talk at a rarefied theoretical level. We really have to show, uh, uh, the, particularly the engineers who have the can-do attitude, that yes, they can do this and here's how. You can do it here and here and here. Uh, and then it's up to them to carry the ball. And you know, Leo, as an economist, as a finance teacher, it's so fun that you started out as a quality of life, a moral happiness, uh, because so, so often people would say, well, look at the bottom line. Don't look at this quality of life. But yeah, well, because what happened is, um, by default, finance economic uh, 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 approach will only look at the type one uh, energy uh, ethic. But what we're often missing uh, in economic and finance is we lack some quantifiable measure that convert quality of life into a dollar value. But I'm working on it, uh, but it's, you know, there's very little literature out there, and you know, I'm sort of like out in the uh, uh, wilderness all by myself. Uh, mm -hmm. But I've, I have uh, written, a, a published a paper in Journal of Social Economics talking about um, uh, the value of planned death. And the value of planned death is basically uh, proposing an alternative thinking about uh, life and death decision. In the U.S., we, uh, medical school teach uh, the doctors to keep people alive. But by alive, they really means that you got a pumping heart and you got a functioning brain. And sometimes the brain doesn't even have to function. All you have is a pumping heart. That is uh, considered a, a live person. But, you know, if you cannot watch TV, you cannot eat, if you cannot talk to the people you love, are you really a living person? You will be surprised. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, 80% of your total life medical expenses are spent in the last two years of life. Yes, in the exactly. And, and, and think about all this would be, uh, what, what would this money, amount of money uh, uh, become if we spend it on our children, our grandchildren, or the health care of the poor people? If those give us satisfaction, if, if, what if we can convert those satisfaction into a monetary value, and then we compare with that 250000 that we have to spend, it's like, wait a minute. We are doing something wrong here. We are setting the wrong priorities. The right priority should be maximizing the well-being, the happiness of people we care, not how much longer we live. People often don't think about uh, this, and I think you know, in the U.S., the mass media don't put out this uh, too much, is that people in a lower caloric diet actually live longer and happier. The United States it has the highest caloric diet per person, per capita, uh, in the world. But the United States also happens to have the highest cancer rate, obesity, 
uh, heart disease, <coughs> colon cancer. Colon cancer, is U.S. beats the rest of the world percentage-wise by a wide margin. Why is that? And think about uh, you know the, the, the country that have consumed about 30 percent or 40 percent less calorie than the United States uh, uh, populations. That's where the, East, uh, the, the, the Western European countries, they all live a happier life, they all live a longer life and healthier life. And the cost to society actually is less. So, And, and maybe that longer, happier life uh, is getting out in the mountains and having good hikes in Utah and Colorado and, and in Michigan. Definitely. Um, what, what are some other things that you think can raise quality of life, make for a happier life, Mike? I, th I think uh, trying to live a less frenzied life. Uh, Boy, I would support that. Yeah. And slow uh, down. I, slow I'm, a, down. I'm a fan yeah. of the slow foods yeah. movement and the slow cities movement. Yeah. I'd say, what's the hurry? Right. You know, and, and if you get there only to jump ahead and do something else, it's a very frantic way of living. So I think slowing down and appreciating the moments that we can uh, when they're there, that's, mm -hmm. I think that's an important sort of thing. And, uh, and we all have to work at that right. because we're always looking ahead or behind. How about now? Mm -hmm. I'm also a big fan of slowing down, except in the ski slope. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, well I, I go down very slowly if, I, if I'm on the skis. So oh. I'll, I'll <laughs> it, it, this has been such a wonderful, wonderful uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Mike Pritchard, Dr. Leo Chan, and our special guest, Dr. Carl Mitchum. And um, it's been a pleasure having you at Utah Valley University and joining with us. On it's been this my pleasure here, in and I've uh, enjoyed having this conversation with you and Mike and Leo, and have especially enjoyed uh, what I've learned in this conversation as well. I think we should do a project together. No, we need to write a paper or do, We should move this forward. That's right, we should move this forward. Why aren't we having this conversation out at that ranch that you told us about? All right, <laughs> we'll do that next <laughs> time. Oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. will go Capital to the Reef. Capital yeah. Reef. Yeah. I'll, I'll be bringing my students in the future down there to um, Perfect. help them. So. Perfect, they'll love it. Well, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.